Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello. I want to say uh, welcome, everybody, to the History Center here. It looks like we have a lot of uh, current students and uh, faculty from Lake Forest College, so it's very nice to see everybody come here. If this is your first time at the History Center, I want to wish you a, a very happy welcome and happy homecoming week at Lake Forest College. Uh, for those of you who I'm not familiar with as of yet, my name is George Sagaev. I am the Programs Manager here at the History Center of Lake Forest Lake Bluff. I'm also a uh, Lake Forest College graduate and graduated last year, and this is my second job out of college. <laughs> and a former student of uh, Dr. Joseph's uh, in the History Department, so it seems like it worked out pretty well. Get to still work with her uh, just down the road, so we're very happy to be putting on this program this afternoon. Uh, we plan this program out to be taking place just before Dr. Jill Barron's State of the College Address, which will be back at the college uh, right afterwards. I'm, I'm thinking most of you will probably go to that afterwards, but uh, Courtney, if there's anything else you want to mention about homecoming, uh, you could do that at the beginning. But uh, just once again, thank you all for coming by. This program is kind of the culmination of our deeply rooted and rising high series of African American programming that we uh, had the opportunity of performing uh, beginning this March due to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Historical Association. So it's been an incredible opportunity to work with professors like Dr. Joseph, as well as longtime Lake Force residents to put on these programs that have been so well received by the community. So that's been a pleasure as well. Uh, this program will run for about 45 minutes to an hour, and we'll have a Q&A section at the very end, about 20, 25 minutes. But feel free to stick around afterwards, uh, explore the History Center, uh, ask us questions. We have staff and, and board members here as well, so uh, if there's anything else we can help you with, we'd be happy to do so. This program is also being recorded uh, in the back room there. It'll be made available for all Lake Forest College students through the digital archives, and it'll also be available to view for free on YouTube at the History Center YouTube channel. So please, uh, even though you attended, feel free to share this around for people who didn't have the chance to make it today. So with that, I'd like to pass the microphone over. I'd like to give you all uh, a very much thank you and then to introduce our uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Courtney Joseph. Thank you, George. Um, George was such an excellent student, so I'm happy to still be able to work with him. You always have bright spots in the classroom, and George is one of them. Um, hello, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Thank you for joining me on a Friday afternoon to talk history. That's probably the last place you thought you would want to be, but I'm going to make this fun. Uh, my name is Courtney Pierre-Joseph, pronoun she, her. I am an assistant professor of history and African American studies at Lake Forest College and a partner with the History Center here, and I'm really excited to share what is becoming the subject of my second book. Um, not fully finished with the first one yet, but don't worry about that. Um, we're talking about the second project today, which gives me life in thinking about black history and black presence at Lake Forest College over time. And today we'll start with the very first one, whose name was William Sullivan Payton. So um, you can tell I'm a professor, so I'd like you to know where we're going today. Um, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here um, in terms of doing this research. How did I find myself doing this? Give you a little bit of the history of the time period that we're talking about, and then you'll be able to learn a little bit about William Payton's family, who he was. We get to see some amazing pictures of his time at Lake Forest, and then just kind of wrap it up and hopefully have time for a really fun Q&A. So you were looking at Lake Forest College's first black graduate, class of 1907, William Sullivan Payton. And how did I find myself doing this research? Well, um, I got hired to work here at Lake Forest College in the fall of 2017. That is when I started. A new position had been created for me um, in a dual appointment in both history and African American studies. This was the first time that we had somebody on our campus solely focused on those things, and they chose the biggest nerd they could find, um, and they were correct on that. One of the things that um, I did in terms of time here is just really working to make sure, especially that our African-American studies program when I first got hired was really 
providing the sorts of classes and education that the campus needed. And so we realized quickly, myself and uh, my fellow faculty, one of them who's in the audience right now, Dr. R.L. Watson, really quickly realized that there was a hunger for more and more African American studies programming, classes, curriculum on campus. And so um, along with some other faculty partners, we pushed advocacy to have an African American studies um, dedicated faculty for the first time in the college's history. And we thought that would be a good time to also then take our studies, um, our African American studies program to departmental status. So we wrote a long report. I won't drag you through that. Just know it took months. It took months to write. <laughs> and and then after um, going through the various bureaucratic processes of campus, we became an department, department officially in the spring of 2021. After that, we decided, okay, this is a huge deal for our campus. We are one of the only African American studies departments in the entire Associated Colleges of the Midwest, one of the only ones in this region, and so we wanted to celebrate that and elevate that, and so we had a gathering last year at homecoming called Black to the Forest, where we brought back alum, current students, to really celebrate what the department had done, the fact that we had gotten here. And in the planning for that, we started thinking about, you know, how would we would celebrate that, what that would mean, what that could look like. And I think on the phone with my colleague, I asked the question, well, who was the first? Who was the first black graduate? Who was the first black people here on campus? And so we did a little digging around, and that's how we met this individual right here, William S. Payton. And so we dedicated our celebration last year to William Payton. And then I wanted more, I needed more. I was like, look at him, seriously, look at him. He's fresh, he's dapper, he looks like he knows something, he looks like he's experienced something. And so I decided I wanted to learn more and use the opportunity of something we have on campus called our Richter Scholar Summer Program. It is something that allows faculty members to work with first years at the end of their first year on a research project. It's an excellent experience, I've done it a few times. But this last time really showed me how powerful um, working with undergraduates really can be, especially in doing the history of the place that we all call home in many ways, the place we work, study, et cetera. And so in the summer of 2022, I had two lovely students, Leah Romanato and Nicole Beck, who are here, do an incredible amount of research on William Sullivan Payton, or as we like to call him, our guy. And I wanted to invite them up here to briefly just tell you a couple of things that they learned or what they enjoyed about doing the research this summer. Hey, so I'm Nicole, and I, Leah and I were very honored to have worked with Dr. Joseph this summer. Um, first of all, I know you asked like what we learned and what we enjoyed the most, but honestly, just working with you over anything would have been amazing. Um, if you don't know Dr. J, you gotta get to know her, she's the best. But I think for me personally, what I enjoyed the most and learned the most was just about black history and more specifically here in Lake Forest. Um, I do go to school here, but I also have lived in the area for a really long time. So I never really realized that I don't know um, the more diverse history here um, where I've lived for my whole life. So I think that uh, over the summer, Dr. J has really helped me open my eyes up more, really helped me to learn a lot more, and I'm gonna be really grateful for that for probably the rest of my life, so thanks. Um, I'm Leah, and just like Nicole said, it was really cool to learn a lot about um, Lake Forest College in specific and an area that we all spend so much time at. So it was really cool to learn the history. Um, and also, this is my first experience uh, doing historic research. So thank you, Dr. Joseph, for that opportunity. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to learn how um, a lot of history is interpreting and not just learning things. So I thought that it was really cool to have experience doing that and understanding the importance of who's writing history and how it's subjective. So um, how to in continue that throughout the future. I 
I thought they'd be tired of me already, but they are not. Um, and that has been a joy. So really, this is a, a collaborative project. It's a community-based project. I continue to work with students on this research. I'll point at the end to the continuation, what I want to do moving forward with this research um, at the end of this presentation. So a little bit of history for you. Um, we are talking about the United States at the end of um, the 20th century, I'm sorry, the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century. So 1880s till about the early 1910s, if we're focusing on William um, Payton's time at Lake Forest and what got him here. So this is an era typically called by historians as the progressive era. It's this huge era of business expansions, quote unquote progressive reform. Folks who call themselves the progressives politically are thinking about ways of making American society more better, a safer place to live. Um, we're thinking about trying to clean up corruption in city governments, working conditions in factories, starting to think more and more about labor um, unionization happening in this period, and overall better living conditions. This is really about the fact that the population in the United States is growing a lot in this period. We have an influx of immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, and specifically at this time, fleeing things like crop failures, job shortages, rising taxes, famine. The United States is really starting to become a place that folks know you can go to, quote, make it in the United States. Um, this is also largely due to the fact that the United States is telling everybody that they're awesome um, in places like the Caribbean and in the Pacific. If we think about the 1898 Spanish-American War, it's actually a fight for Cuba. Sometimes these wars are name thing and people are like, yeah, what does that mean? Spanish-American War is a fight over who would own Cuba, right? At the same time that we're in the Philippines doing similar work that's about, quote, spreading democracy, but what does that really mean in a United States context? We're also building the railroads at this time. So if we think about the expansion in, um, of the United States to go from, quote, sea to shining sea, right? The railroad is one major way of folks being able to do that. If we're thinking about African American history, which I specifically focus on, this is the end of the Reconstruction era. This is the moment after the Civil War has ended and it's seeming like, yeah, we're gonna put ourselves back together. African Americans are gonna be considered citizens for the first time in the country's history. Everything is gonna go great, right? No. Um, <laughs> Reconstruction is ultimately in many ways short-lived. While there are many things that happen that do create major lifelong change in this country, and specifically 13th Amendment, the end of slavery, unless you have been convicted of a crime. That's a whole other discussion that I can get into, but don't have time today. The 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship in this country. If you were born in the United States, you are a citizen. And the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Those are amendments that are still in the Constitution still today. Now, some people don't like them, but that's another discussion as well. And so with those amendments and with the shifting tide in the country, remember that we had fought a war. The country had broken up, and the people in the former Confederacy were not pleased to have lost, okay? They didn't take that loss very well. And so even with all of these changes in law, you can't necessarily make people's attitudes change. And so after Reconstruction ends, you have what is known as the start of the Jim Crow period, this idea of separate but equal that is officially codified in 1896 with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. I teach this to my students when I teach a second half of an African American history survey, and I really think about how Jim Crow is defined by segregation, racial terror, incredible violence. Um, I, it, this era of lynchings and race riots and such, this is a very dangerous era for people of color and particularly black people. Especially when you consider that they're just trying to get an education, just trying to establish themselves for the first time after being considered property or three-fifths of a person for, again, the start, the first hundred years of this country. The other person that I pictured here, I can never go anywhere without talking about Ida B. Wells. I love her. My Barbie is at home currently. 
I'm a Chicagoan and a, an activist and somebody who is important to this moment, the Chicago 90, um, the 1893 World's Fair that happens in Chicago. It is supposed to celebrate Columbia's, uh, the Colombian Exposition, Columbus landing in America. You know that's not right, okay. Um, you know he did not land, anyway. They decide to celebrate that, and it is at that, um, that, that era that we have the Haitian Pavilion, we have Frederick Douglass speaking there, and we have Ida B. Wells speaking there. So if you are driving down Chicago and you get onto the Ida B. Wells Drive, that's who we are honoring, a black activist and journalist who shines a light on a lot of the racial terror and what's really motivating it during the Jim Crow era. That takes us to... Uh, Lake Forest College, yes. It's one of my favorite historical pictures of all time. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for sending this my way. I think about this picture often. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. So Lake Forest College is actually founded, as many of you may know or may not know, um, in 1857, but first in the, under the name Lind University. It's about 1855, some Chicago Presbyterians decide, you know, Chicago's doing too much, okay? They got too much going on, so why don't we look for something a little bit outside of the area? It's a group, you know, that could be between Evanston and Waukegan in particular, and this is how they eventually lead to, excuse me, founding the college. Even though um, at first it is founded as an all-male institution, right, that just immediately starts with high school classes, they start to add collegiate classes within the first few years, but I don't know if anybody knows what happened between, I don't know, like 1861 and 1865, anybody in the audience? No. It's just this little thing called the Civil War. And so it became really hard for people to go to college in the midst of said war. And so we see a little bit of a, um, you know, dip, obviously, in the history of the college at that time. But they still were building, and by the time the war was over, it's named, um, officially becomes Lake Forest University. And it goes under tremendous growth, especially in its first 50 years. One of the funnest things that I think Leah and Nicole and I found was looking at the information of how they became co-ed and how it was really important for, you know, um, one of the wives of the donors, her name's uh, Mary E. Smith Farwell. She is the spouse of U.S. Senator Charles B. Farwell, who decided that she wanted her daughter to be able to um, stay at home, but also pursue a college degree. And she wanted something that would be like being on the East Coast, but still was like in the area. And so it was because of her that the college eventually allows women in there. But don't worry, college wants everybody to know at the time that they will still be women. They're not just gonna be too smart now. They could still come and find a husband because this is the era we were living in. And I remember us looking through the archive and Leah and Nicole were like, what's this? And I was like, it's the 1900s, that's why. Um, and is it that far off today? We'll never know. Um, so we see that early on, some of the original intention of the college is to be seen as the Harvard of the Midwest an elite liberal arts college education where the most elite of the Midwest could come and go off into their education. And even the women who came here, they felt the same way about it. So we think that what that's one of the things that drew William Payton to the area, is that Lake Forest was trying to build itself in surrounding states as a place where if you don't want to go out east, you can send your kid to Lake Forest College to get a very elite and great education. We see some early evidence of um, black students attending Lake Forest Academy, as it was um, still known, in the high school classes early on. We could not identify them, unfortunately. They were not named in any of the things that we found, but it doesn't look like Lake, um, William Payton was the first African-American student necessarily to attend. We just know he's the first to graduate. Um, and then we also know that there were African Americans who worked for the college, pictured here, as I said, one of my favorite photographs of all time. You see a man named Julian Matthews sitting in what is his dope cart. No, he was not a member of the Clips. He was an ice cream seller. 
Um, and this is him in 1906 selling ice cream to some of the college students. He had formerly worked as a coachman for President Roberts of the college and owned a livery station in town. Now him and Samuel Dent are two of the most probably known early African American figures in the Lake Forest area. And working at stables was one way that really got them um, established within the area. So. Julian Matthews is clearly on his hustle because he also has the ice cream that people are very pleased to have in this photograph. We also know, um, thanks to another dear colleague of mine, Rebecca Graff, who couldn't be here today, she was doing some um, archaeological digs on South Campus where there used to be an AME church, an African American church that eventually the school, um, I don't know how, but the land was given to the school, um, and so she's been able to um, do some, some excavation on what, what was there before, and Leah and Nicole were able to talk to her as well over the summer and found some um, evidence of, was it President Harlan who um, did some speeches over at the AME church at the same time? So there seems to have been some connection between these two spaces as well. So William Payton. Before we get to William Payton, I think it's important for us to think about the sort of family that William Payton came from. He is from a family with a mother and a father. Now, if African American stereotypes have you believing that most African Americans come from single parent homes, that is a lie. And that is also propaganda and a result oftentimes of policies that the United States has on black families. But this is not one of those families. This is a very elite family, which is important to consider how it was a black elite person who was the first graduate of Lake Forest College. His father, who I'll go to a picture of, um, is named William Payton as well. William T. Payton, born in Georgia in 1852, so we're talking pre-Civil War, right? So he is born in the South, in slavery, at a time where slavery is really going to eventually bubble up in the next decade, right, and lead to a civil war. However, his father is an anomaly in many ways. He's one of the first black men in Louisville, Kentucky, to receive his master's. He taught at schools in different states across the South. He was a very influential educator, so much so that he um, inspires other upcoming civil rights activists, including a man named Joseph Seaman Cotter, who needed to go to school and needed inspiration, and it was from William Payton's father that they did this. He was the Grand Master of a Mason Lodge, showing how well connected he was to um, African American organizations, and in particular, more elite organizations. But we probably lost it the most when we found out what happened to William T. Payton. Now, William S. Payton, our Lake Forest College graduate, graduates from the college in 1907. It is in 1908 that his father dies by a suicide after performing an illegal abortion and was going to be arrested for it. And so he takes his own life in the hospital before he can be arrested. For this and it gave the three of us chills especially since we were doing research around the time that Roe v Wade was knocked down so to think about the relationship about how close we are in time to some of these things and how these things touch us in different ways that we may not know was really interesting to find out we're sure that must have had a tremendous impact on Peyton's family for the rest of their time together, and that may give us an understanding on why the family stays so close together for the rest of their lives. His mother we do not have a picture of, but her name is Mary Pope Clark Peyton. She probably looked as beautiful as her daughter. First of all, isn't this a good-looking family? My God. Um, Mary P Pope Clark Payton, born circa between 1861 and 1862. Again, when you're doing research on African Americans, the records are not always there. We need to remember that part of slavery was keeping African American people from learning how to read and write and being able to keep their own records. So some of these records are incomplete. And that's OK. We do the best with what we have. And so to rectify and to refine their life, I think, speaks to trying to do some of that work. She dies in 1957, was also a teacher, and probably gave you know the teaching bug to her kids along with her husband. 
um, and again lives a long life where she is with her children, it seems, when she dies in 1957. She outlives her daughter, Atheleen Payton, pictured here, born around 1878, 1879, also a teacher. She is so cool. Um, <laughs> she taught at the school eventually that her and her brother graduated from, Louisville Central High School. She is the first black woman to publish a cookbook um, ever. Um, and it is, um, you can find the archive, it's called Petonia's um, Cookbook, published in 1906. And she is one of the first black women to earn a degree in food science. So really thinking about the ways that both of them are finding educational paths for themselves and, and making a name for themselves and their family through that. She dies in, um, as I said, 1951, so her mother outlives her as well as her brother. So let's get to our guy, William Sullivan Payton. Born, and again, we think some records tell us 1880, some say 1881, some say 1882. So somewhere between 1880 and 1882, he is born on June 10th in Louisville, Kentucky. So is he a Gemini? Do we know that? It may tell us things about him. Anyway, got to get his moon sign and stuff. Not really. So um, he um, spends his childhood there. He graduates um, from Louisville Central High School in about 1899 and then attends Lake Forest Academy to finish out high school classes. It is from there that he goes on to Lake Forest um, College in 1902. He, um, we think he may have graduated early. We have some evidence saying that maybe he was working already in 1906. I'm gonna tell you now, William Payton hustled, okay? William Payton knew what it meant to work hard and he never stopped, literally never stopped working it seems. So, um, you know, it seems that he had some summer work and also was working already as a teacher um, in the summer of 1906, but he's officially seen as a graduate of Lake Forest College in 1907. Between um, the time he leaves college and uh, the early, the mid 1930s, he is working various teaching jobs. Now we found gold um, with some of the stuff that we found about William Payton. Lee and Nicole were emailing all sorts of people. We were getting files about him um, that filled in major gaps in his life. So I think there was one day I left, uh, we left to research and I said, okay, we can't find him between like 1930 and 1950. And then the next day we had like a whole file on that time and I was like, well, there's that. Um, and it found out so much about who he was and what he thought was most important, which again seems to be education. He was survived two world wars and a great depression and lives and works various jobs, including a job on the railroad at some point and lives until 1962. So let's get to some fun pictures. This is Lake For or this is William Payton at Lake Forest Academy. I'm not sure how much of these you can see, but that's the listing of the students. And so we see where he was. They used to list where um, the students lived in in various um, programming in the past. Um, this is his picture from his Lake Forest Academy graduation, still giving us smize, still giving us fashions, um, and giving us all of the dapperness. So I mean, a man, to have the imagery and to think about him showing us who he is in these photographs and you know, probably being aware, very aware, of the fact that he is one of, if not the only black student in the in the area, kind of speaks to the refinement. I think that he's he wants to be seen with in this photograph. And then the fact again that he is from a pretty elite family, it would make sense that he would have access to such dress, et cetera, et cetera. We believe that is him. We believe that is a baby version of him. I'm gonna walk over. early black representation on campus and to um, even today to bringing black people on to our campus um, now as a recruitment tool. So this is the other picture. If you look at the edge of this picture, all right, I'm going to walk back over. gives 
gives us the information of thinking that William Payton wasn't completely alone early on. Um, we see as well, we think this is the picture of him um, on the relay team, and same thing again as you can see another black student in this photograph. Um, and yes, my students said we asked a question, why are they in black shirts and the other ones are not? We could not really figure that out, but segregation was happening, so I don't know. <laughs> um, potentially to show difference, although the skin color would have done that, I guess. This is William Payton um, again before he, um, while he is at Lake Forest College at the time. Again, we found him listed class of 1906, but then also class of 1907. Um, if you can catch him up here, we love, love, love this photograph. He is circled at the top. He's like totally in the cut, but again, serving face. God, these kids had no idea the fashions that William Payton was laying upon them. And this photograph also then shows the co-ed kind of, you know, nature of the institution at the time that he was there. I need us to think about how potentially dangerous that could have been for him as well, um, thinking about the, the laws of the time of proximity of black men to white women in particular as being dangerous and could have led to all sorts of things. And yet he is able to take up space here with them. Them, which again has us thinking about how he's an anomaly in many ways and is, is not necessarily representative of the life that many people were able to live in this time. This is that first picture I showed you and this is the um, yearbook when he graduates that kind of told us first about him. So this is the first thing that I found of him and this is what unlocked the keys into getting us more stuff about his life. So. This is, you know, telling us he's born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1881, um, that he went to Louisville Central High School, graduated in 1899, Lake Forest Academy, entered college, he played football, he ran track, and that he majored in chemistry. So shout out to my friend in the audience, uh, Will Conrad from the chemistry department. Um, and, and we, as you know, will teach. And that, again, unlocked a lot of things for us to be able to do census data research, um, archival research in the Lake Forest Forest College and um, town archives, newspaper research, we definitely got into a lot of things with this. He was a really, really active student. Again, there he is on the track team. Again, the only black student and still dressed in a black shirt. Again, not quite sure what that means, but I feel the speed already from him. He probably was playing no games. Um, also involved musically, so he is um, playing um, violin at some point. Like, what? Like, how talented is this guy? He's a violinist and performed on campus, and that thing in the middle says, um, the whole program was a high, of a high grade, the solo work of Miss Ryan and Mr. Payton being especially commendable. So the fact that he gets a shout out even and had a solo speaks to how excellent um, of, of a student and a presence he was on the campus. He also was part of the science club. So, I mean, William Payton was doing it. He was kind of really, in my opinion, kind of setting a path for what a forester should kind of look like in many ways, like active on various parts of campus, not just one part of campus, right? Really taking advantage of all the parts of a liberal arts education. He shot shot put. What? I mean, look at those arms, okay? Um, William Payton was doing it. And really, for us, this was excellent. This was so fun to learn. We had the best time learning it. But I told you I have a PhD in African American history, right? And I've been telling you that this was a fraught time. This is the Jim Crow period. Formerly enslaved people who were alive during the Jim Crow period often felt like somehow things had gotten worse for them than they had in, under slavery. So I knew there was some racism there. I just felt it. I was like, it has to be here. Haven't found anything yet, haven't found anything yet. And then we found this. This was the first day, I think, of us together, wasn't it? Yes, and then I was like, they're never coming back. It's too sad. So we look and look in one of the yearbooks, 
and there is a list of nicknames for the various students. Not sure why, but they had this printed in the yearbook. And we see next to Peyton's name the word Rastus. And I said, Rastus, what, what does that mean? Went to the thing that I always go to when I don't know something called the Googles, and um, found this. This is the original Rastus, a um, stereotype, a caricature of an African-American man. Again, checked with my colleague, Dr. Watson, after this, and she was like, oh, yes, this is one of the stereotypes associated with African-Americans at the time to represent them as docile and not that smart and, you know, needing and so happy to be around black folks. And this is the nickname that William Payton was given. Now, all of these nicknames are not great. Many of them, not so nice. But for us, what was important was to think about the ways that his nickname was racialized, specifically. It could have been called, you know, I don't know, clown. But they didn't just call him that. They made sure to associate him with something about his race. And so, this to us, and to me in particular, spoke to the importance of thinking about tokenism and how that is a form of racism, that you can be the only black person on the campus because you're special. You're different than the other black people. You're not like them. You want to be around us. You know how to act around us. And so that's what makes you OK to be here. Not the fact that he was a shot put and a violinist and you know a football player and a chemistry major. Just what? This is important again in thinking about the ways that um, racism functions differently in different spaces and that it's not always the exact same sort of physical violence that people experience in certain places and maybe a place like this. Sometimes it's the unsaid, under-discussed way of seeing black people as one-offs who make it here, as opposed to representative of a heterogeneous and, and brilliant community long-term. But again, like Beyonce, nothing could stop William Payton, OK? And um, after teaching, um, or after graduating from Lake Forest, he goes on to teach at, in a school in 1906 in Normal, Alabama. By 1908, he is teaching English and education in Louisville. So it seems like after the incident with his father happened, he went back home and was with the family and stayed there for a few years. We find him in 1913 then in Lincoln teaching um, at, at school, being a principal, I'm sorry, at um, a school called the Lincoln Colored School. Now this is where it gets spicy um, for William Payton. Between 1913, he takes over the position for somebody who um, got promoted somewhere else. So he's interim principal. And then the next principal dies. So he becomes like principal for a while at this school. But by 1916, he has been fired from his position. And this is, again, where it gets spicy. Apparently, he got into some trouble with his um, teaching methods. They said, um, this is a time where spanking children was allowed in school, and uh, William Payton used that. He used that, we believe, to protect the children who were going to go out into a very dangerous world. But I love that they were like, William Payton was getting a little bit too hard on these kids, and he had to go. I think that William Payton knew what it was going to take to make it in this world. So by 1916, he goes on to teach science at a college in Augusta, Georgia, where he teaches for 10 years. He then moves on to teach biology at a school in Charlotte, North Carolina, until 1931. And then 1930s, again, this is the Great Depression. So what does William Payton do? We find him back in Louisville at this time. He is working odd jobs, kind of teaching and doing what he can to kind of make a living. He also um, was involved in both world wars. It does not look like he was drafted, though, in either of the world wars, just was able to work some odd jobs doing some war um, manufacturing at the time. And then eventually, again, he ends up back in Louisville in the 1950s. And he dies at his family home um, in 1962. 
So what does this tell us? Um, Number one, I think William Payton is, again, an incredible historical figure, just somebody that I think deserves so much light shown upon his life. He is one of the few black people who, you know, makes it in many ways out of this era, but also his ability to be here is what allows so many of us to be here now. It's important to think about his social economic location. Again, it is not... It makes perfect sense that he comes from a pretty big wig, high, falutin family to make his way up to Lake Forest. The family, all of them are educators, including him, and spend their life dedicated to education like so many black people in this period do. And they believed in the power of education to create mobility in their lives. When you talk about, I think Lake Forest now is number two for social mobility or something in the country. William Payton is an example of what that really means. Being able to use uh, education and the connection that you make at this place to do the next things that you need to for yourself. Overall, his life at Lake Forest College seemed pretty fine. Seemed like it was fine. Seemed like it was a good time. Um, But again, he was referred to as Rastus, and that's in the yearbook. And there are so many things that we cannot know about William Payton's life. It does not seem that he was ever married or ever had any kids. So we cannot go and see and get maybe oral histories, which is something that I love, about what his time was like from his perspective. We can speculate, but I think that that impact of having that listed in the yearbook says a lot um, about maybe the sorts of day-to-day that he experienced. He was likely connected to the wider black community in Lake Forest. Like we said, that AME church may have been a same space for him to go to during his time on campus. And overall, he was able to have a successful career as an educator by the time that he was finished. Um, What does his story tell us about black presence at the college? I mean, it took 50 years. It took 50 years for the institution to graduate their first black student from 1957 to 1907. And from the research that I'm now doing with students, it seems like there's going to be a big gap in time before another black student graduates from Lake Forest College. And so it doesn't necessarily mean like, it's like, wow, we're super progressive, but like, what does that really mean in the long term um, in the institution and in the institution's history and in its memory? Um, I think there's still a lot to, to learn about that. As I said, I am, I mean, we found gold with William Payton. Over 50 primary sources have been collected for this project, and I don't think that an article is enough space to get into it. And so um, I would like to make this my second book and think about black history of the college itself. Um, So some of the initial questions that I want to ask is, when did the next black student really graduate? I have a student working right now through the yearbooks between 1910 and 1920. She hasn't been able to find anything of a black student, but she's found other stuff. Um, What is the history of black faculty at the college? Starting to do a little bit of that, um, we just wanted to say the name of Clayton Gray, um, who started in the college in the 1970s, and we know that he is the first black faculty to be tenured at the college. And so um, I was able to do a quick oral history interview with him this summer, and just to get his experience and what that was like to be the first black faculty member here. I think if my estimation is correct as I'm going up for tenure now I'll be the ninth black person in the college's history to ever be tenured the third black woman to ever be tenured in the college's history tell that to the committee y'all I got an interview soon Um, and so you know what does it mean that this is still a relatively new history I mean even William Payton that's about 115 years ago but for the faculty and the staff side of things we're talking 1960s, 1970s, and the 1980s, I mean, into the 1990s. So this is work that's more recent. This is, this is change that has become, you know, that is still in, in happening right now. Um, So I want to do a little bit of that. And, you know, as we continue as a campus to grapple with so many things, I am a big um, proponent in thinking about how histories of the past can help us to maybe better understand what we're doing in the future. And so I hope that thinking about the history of black people, black presence, issues of race and racism at our campus in the past can help us to better understand why and what 
issues we still deal with um, right now and maybe what are some pathways to thinking about them more creatively than maybe we already are. Lots of references here. Shout out to Ancestry all day. And thank you so much to the um, History Center, to Carol, to George, um, to Andre, who doesn't want me to say his name, but I said it. Um, alumni Relations, my departments, to Leah and Nicole, and most in especially to William Payton. I love you, sir. Thank you so much for bringing me to this project. Thank you, everyone. Take some questions. Yeah. Purely from photographs, um, a lot of the records from um, the time period did not last. We weren't able to find his student file. There have been like way too many fires on this campus over time. It's like, and then this fire, and then that fire. It's like, that's a lot of fires, y'all. Um, and so we haven't been able to find any records. But then once we went back to the census data information and looked him up, that's when we were able to officially confirm that he and his family identified as African American. No, and we don't even know if those things exist. We couldn't find them in the archives. We're currently in the midst of trying to get an archivist back in our college archives, so hopefully that will be some help that um, we can have. Anyone else? Yeah. We're looking, we spent a lot of time on the old maps, looking for something called the East Dormitory. So that's where he was living when he was part of the academy. We're not sure what that building translated into later on. And then when he was on campus, in terms of the college itself, not sure. Yes. Yeah, one would think, right, and I think that even is a selling point for the college now is that they tell everybody, we're, you know, we right next to Chicago, and then students get there and they're like, what do you mean right next to? Um, you know, like that's a little bit of a weird um, thing to come to. Um, and so one would imagine it, but I think that um, the bubble and the elite bubble of this institution has kept it from really being as integrated as um, one would imagine it to be. Um, there are um, examples that I'm finding of things that show uh, over time that there were examples of anti-black racism on campus and in the area, which would help to explain why black folks maybe don't feel comfortable coming to the area. I know when I did, um, and my colleague Rudy Batzel is here from history department, we did um, a little like swap day with some students at Waukegan High School a few years back, and that was the first time any of them had ever come to Lake Forest. They had never even really heard of the institution. Um, and when they came here, they were like, this is here. So there's also something to be said about the fact that it is not something that students, in particular students of color, like I went, I lived in Chicago, um, south side of Chicago. I had no idea this thing, this place existed until I applied for a job here. So, and I was like, oh, that's by the, uh, the Six Flags. I went there as a kid, but never knew there was a college there. And so there's something to be said about where the college markets itself, how the college markets itself, um, where they do um, recruitment at specifically, and understanding, having a like understanding of the area as a friendly place for people of color. I don't think that that has happened as much as folks would think. You do. 
You do, and yet they don't. Chicago seems it, and we have to remember that with the Great Migration, that's um, you know many dashed promises. You know that what does better mean is often the questions of African Americans who leave the South and come to a place like Chicago, and it seems they're told you know it's going to be great, and you know this is the land of Lincoln, and all of this stuff, and still experience things like race riots. Um, there's a race riot in, in Springfield in 1908 that sparks the start of the NAACP, and this is the era that William Payton is, is living in the area. And so we have to think about those bigger contextual clues and then how you know, folks will speak to them, you know, to people in their community about here's a good place that you can be. Yes. There's a larger narrative of how systemic segregation actually undercuts everything that's special about the yes. people who work for the railroad. So as African American students go to white schools, there are no longer predominantly white schools, there are no longer spaces for for segregated professional uh white students to have a meaningful mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, he lives through, you know, uh, in 54 with Brown v. Board, right? And like even what happens with the Negro Leagues in baseball, right? They take the students, they take the players, but they don't take the teachers, the coaching, the staff, all the people who work behind the scenes, they lose their jobs. And so um, it seems like there, you know, maybe was a different points contention for him around education, again, in the sorts of things that he wanted to focus on and, and the methods of education. But I think that by the time he's working odds and end jobs, I think it's because he wants to be back home near his family. I think, you know, he keeps going back to Louisville at different parts, and in particular the fact that he, his mother, and his sister are all listed at the house on their death certificates says something about the, the importance of family and so we just think that you know like as he aged as his sister aged as his mom aged that took him back to Louisville in order to just be able to help support he was a waiter at some point too so I think he was just picking up jobs in retirement as well just to help support the family um, since it seemed like more than likely he was probably still the main breadwinner um, after his father died No, no, he did not. No. Yes, and then back there. I'm sorry? I think he was done. Um, I don't think that there were like likely many um, as many job opportunities in the area for him in terms of education. It doesn't seem like it. And the fact that um, he's already working back in the South, this happens to a lot of um, African Americans. They get educated and then they want to take their talents and stuff back home to serve the communities who are not getting this sort of education. I mean, we're talking about schools in former shacks and old plantation houses and old churches with old books and not as many um, educated teachers. And so there's a big void for that, and I think that he likely goes back home to help to fill that. Um, and then with what happens after the year after he graduates with his father dying suddenly, I think that also is what brought him back home and kept him back home. Yes. There was, seems to be um, pull happening. There are a lot of other elite folks from Kentucky, elite white folks, who were sending their kids to Lake Forest at the time. Uh, 
a little bit better, yes. And then, you know, fi likely the fact his connections that his father had. His father is, is kind of a big wig in, in Louisville, Kentucky. So we kind of thought, okay, maybe through his network, he heard of Lake Forest and thought, okay, that's a place I can send my son and sent him there. Yeah, there were a lot of students um, from from East Coast and 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 from the early uh, kind of Upper South area who sent their kids to Lake Forest College. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that there and then there? That's a great question. We wish these fires had not happened. Um, <laughs> um, right now, we don't have any of, we could not find any of his records for admission. So we don't have any documentation that tells us specifically what got him here. Now, I think, you know, even now, one of the main ways that we are able to get African-American students at Lake Forest College is through athletics. Um, a lot of my, you know, African-American students that I have in classes come from football or from basketball. And so it was interesting to me to think about how that's a, a we see a similar sort of thing, like he plays football, he runs track. And so athletics, I know, even over time, especially um, with the question on desegregation, that was an early way, an easy way to like get black students in and then they could kind of have the shield of, of being an athlete and that would be something that maybe folks would not have as much terror around of having a black student. Now, I spoke to a, a, a graduate of 1963 recently who um, called me after he saw this project was happening and told me a story about how during his senior year, the um, number of black students between 19, I think it was it's night, summer of 1962 or 61, there were three black students and then there were 100 in the new class. And he said it was not pretty in terms of the reception, not so much of the students, but of the town and of the administration and some of the faculty. And so I think there's evidence that shows, you know, even if folks want to bring in, you know, a more diverse student body or student class, that there are other, you know, mechanisms or other parts of the community that they may not be as excited about that. So maybe using, if he was on a scholarship or had anything special about him, that could have been a way to say again, oh, he's different than the others, he's okay to be here. But I don't have that info. There was a hand there and then there. We have, we don't have any of that, although I, you know, I don't know if the family itself has an archive, but um, there is, where is his, his card, his draft card? There. Um, he wrote, but we have seen his signature on a few things, so um, that was cool to find as well. Remember something? Oh yeah, that is in his handwriting. That's why I need these two at all times. So yeah, that's all in his handwriting too, um, at the top. They did. I mean, I'm used to doing research on African American people or black people where you have like some oral traditions and a scrap of paper. Um, and I'll be putting it together and making it work. So um, what we did first was go through the yearbook and then we went to Ancestry to look at census records. And once we got into the census records, that unloaded a lot more information for us about where he lived, things like that, who the family was, that then sent us, okay, well now let's look for the family in these things. Let's look in city directories. Oh, he taught here for a while. So I think it was like in Louisville, that, I think, was it one of you that emailed the people like, hey, we're looking for William Payton. Do you have some stuff? 
and then they sent us over something. And then um, there were some, um, we found the, the burial sites for the family online and were able to connect with a woman who had been doing some research on other families who were buried in that same site. So it's just like kind of just really going down the rabbit hole of whatever little clue that we could get um, that we would then say, oh, that could point us, well, let's think about this. Maybe we'll know this if we can look here, maybe we look there. So the yearbooks and then ancestry and then using those tidbits of information to ask questions, to reach out to people. Is that school still there? If it's not still there, maybe they have an archive in the town. Let's email them. Let's talk to an archivist here. Here, let's go here. So they visited the Lake History or the Lake Bluff, um, the the center we're in right now. At some point, to look through their records. So it's just as much as you can find. And then when you find another like solid piece of information, using that to then try to find something else. Yeah. There's another hand. Yes. It seemed there were about, yeah, 20 of them total about. Um, yeah, it was still a pretty small um, institution at the time, but not too many folks, yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> the, both of you. We did. We absolutely did. <laughs> we did. Um, yes. Yeah, which is terrible. I actually was able to confirm that William Payton was the first graduate from our former archivist, um, and and Thomason, who was absolutely lovely. And we thought we had a person, but we were like, is he really the first? We asked the folks in the library, and I emailed Anne and said, you know, I'm doing this thing. Do you know who the first black graduate was? And she was like, yeah, William Payton, class of 1907. And I was like, wow, like you know, she was able, she had had that information. So none of this work is as much possible without archivists, but we were able to work with archivists here. We got a little bit of time to go into the library, our archive at the college for like a day or two and just look through a few documents, but it wasn't the same as like the knowledge of archivists, right? Like they know the documents, they've been with them for a while, they've been able to catalog them and such, and so there's nothing like being able to go to an archivist and say, hey, this is something I'm working on, and then they say to you, oh, that reminds me, have you looked at this box? And they'd be doing stuff like this, and you're like, I'm about to get gold. Like, you know, like they have, you know, kind of more intimate knowledge of the documents that can help lead us in all sorts of directions. So um, shout out to archivists everywhere. They really, they really are the peeps. You had your hand up. No, neither of them married. Neither William nor Atheline married. Again, the family stayed together until the end. And so, um, no, unfortunately, we do not have any information about any um, descendants of them. Yes. They are in the library. They're also digitized um, online, yes. So um, they are open and available to, for people to look through, which I also thought was absolutely fascinating. So if you Google um, Lake Forest College yearbooks, it's on something called um, archive, like internetarchive.com. They have all of them there. Not all of them, because we're trying to find. Do y'all have the 1918 through 1919 to 1920 yearbooks? Yeah, they're not online either, and so. That's a good. Point. Okay, so yeah, you see how this this is this is that was a live history action. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a student looking for. She's looked through 1910 through 1917 for me, but then she was like, "Where are the other ones?" So um, we're on the hunt for those. They do, they do. So that the center is not digitized, as I recall, or is it? It is. Okay, it was digitized. So we were able to look through some of those as well. The college, the student newspaper um, that has been around. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
No problem. There was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are a young historian, I like you. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, thinking about um, the racial climate of the era is very important. And so thinking about how this is still Jim Crow segregation era is going to definitely have an impact on how he was able to move about or experience the campus. That's for sure. The fact that the um, a race riot happens again downstate just a year after he graduates also speaks to how things are kind of bubbling, right? These things don't happen just randomly or accidentally, right? There's some kind of precursor in things that occur that would lead to that. Um, we found another great article, and this is in the time, this is I think 1910, um, talking about how there was something called a Negro Club, the term for African Americans that was acceptable at the time, and that the people in the town were scandalized because the Negro Club was partying over the weekend and had banjos and beer flowing, and it sounded lit. And they had, were having like the best time ever, and that the people in the town had like sent the police to like, you know, look and kind of see, you know, if they were breaking any rules, but they weren't. And so it was like, you know, we're watching for this club, but, you know, they're having too good of a time. And so, you know, that spoke to me a little bit of maybe the surveillance, right, uh, of black folks in the area at the time being, you know, hyper vigilantly watched potentially. Otherwise, I don't have too much to go off of in terms of what he maybe specifically had experienced. But I know what it's like to be oftentimes the only one, right, in a space and to be hyper aware of what it feels like to be the only person of color, the only black person in a classroom. I can't imagine in a school at the whole time. And so I think relying on his family, having such a like strong network to his family back home is probably something that sustained him. Um, and then maybe, you know, being able to attend the AME church where at least have connections to that are probably ways that he was able to feel home in many ways when, you know, again, he was the only one. Was that a question? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time. Dr. Joseph, thank you once again. Uh, incredibly captivating and engaging as always. So thank you again for doing that. And thank you, uh, Leah and Nicole, again, for uh, sharing your experiences on the research as well. Uh, so before we depart uh, for this afternoon, I just wanted to give a couple concluding remarks as to what's going on at the History Center uh, for the rest of this year. This year has been a resounding success for programming already. We've had uh, multiple un unveilments of large projects coming up. Of course, our Deeply Rooted and Rising High series of programs, which has been great. Most of those have been recorded and are available uh, for view on our YouTube channel as well, all for free. Uh, this was also our 50th anniversary this year of the History Center, so we began in 1972, and we had our 50th celebration back on June 17th, uh, which was a resounding success as always. Thank you for all those who attended that and contributed to that success. Um, we also unveiled another project uh, on that day. Near the back of the room, there are some tables with green brochures on them. Some of you are probably familiar with this project. It, the uh, Garden and Endowment Initiative that we unveiled in June uh, a long-term project for the next two, three years to build a set of educational gardens around the perimeter of the History Center. So if you are interested in something like that, I do recommend you take a brochure. We have plenty to go around. Uh, get yourself familiar with that project. Just another way to uh, stay involved with the History Center. There's plenty of programming on the way to, to collaborate with that too. So uh, moving forward, uh, we do have one more Deeply Rooted and Rising High program scheduled for next Thursday on Zoom. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, the Shorefront Legacy Center in Evanston, Illinois, with uh, Dino Robinson, who's the former acting director and founder of Shorefront. Uh, so that program is free of charge, and you can register on our main website, and that'll be at 7 p.m. on next Thursday. Uh, so I hope to see you all there. 
Uh, we also have uh, a number of upcoming tours. I'll be doing a tour, an architecture tour of Lake Forest College uh, on October 15th. So if you want to learn some more about the college, I know we have a couple students here, so uh, feel free to sign up for that as well. Uh, and then we also have on uh, October 21st, we will be uh, hosting our local legends event. So every year we choose a prominent figure of the community and honor them at a, at a ceremony. This year we'll be honoring Edward J. Waymer, the CEO and founder of Wintrust Financial. So I believe general admission for that event has been sold out, but we, stu uh, we still have some sponsorships available for that event. Uh, and we've got plenty more coming up, uh, plenty of new exhibits, plenty of new uh, programs, ways to get involved. Uh, and just a message to all the students here, uh, the History Center's doors are always open to you. You're always welcome to come here to do research if you're ever doing a project or you need some you know, extra sources, help with researching. Um, if you're in Rebecca Graff's class and need a garbology assignment, you're free to take our garbage. Um, so, and we also offer a lot of volunteering opportunities here as well. So if you want to get involved here, uh, I head volunteering here. So if you're looking for ways to maybe you know, work at the front desk or getting some experience doing research, writing digital articles, we have plenty of opportunities here as well. So, uh, and we also have uh, plenty of board members here who are happy uh, to talk to you about other ways to get involved here. So once again, Dr. Joseph, thank you. Leah Nicole, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. And thank you to all of you as well for attending. None of this is possible without all of you. So hope to be seeing you soon. Thank you.